Okay, so welcome to the ultimate stock trading course for beginners. So who is this course for? Well, if you are someone who is totally new to the financial markets, you want to learn more about stocks, how it works, then hey, this course is for you. Or maybe you're a trader, right? Maybe you trade the Forex or crypto markets, but you have no idea, you know, what stock is about and you want to, you know, dive in deeper. Then hey, this course is for you as well. Or perhaps you're someone who wants to use the stock markets to help you, you know, generate uh, another source of income, to help you beat inflation or to just grow your wealth over time. Then hey, this course is for you as well. So before I get started, my name is Rainer. I am the uh, founder of tradingwithrainer.com and here's what I want you to do right now. Hit the thumbs up button, right? And subscribe to my YouTube channel. The link is all below. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And this way, whenever I publish a new video, you'll always stay up to date. Never miss another training from me again. Sounds good. Then do it right now. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. The link is below. So with that said, right, let's begin. So have a look at this, right? This is Apple. Okay, so Apple. Okay, so uh, it's a slight mistake over here, right? So as, at the time when I did this slides, right, Apple was worth 731 billion. But as of today, it is a slightly higher. You know, the stock market, it goes up and down. So this one is a little bit dated, but it's there about 700 plus billion market uh, capitalization, right? This stock. So Apple, what does it mean to buy a share of Apple? After all, you want to learn stock trading, right? You're going to buy shares. What does it mean to buy a share? So when you buy a share of a company, what is it? Apple, Facebook, Amazon, whatever. It means that you're a part owner of the company. It might seem sound weird. What? I'm an owner? Yes, you're an owner, but just a very small, small minority owner. So let me explain. So if you go down to this website over here, right? It's Finviz finviz.com, a very useful website, it gives you a lot of financial data, stock prices and stuff like that. And you'll see that right now, Apple, the market cap, okay, it's uh, $793 billion. That is the market capitalization of Apple, the value of Apple, okay, almost $800 billion. And right now, the price is about $165 per share. So if you're going to buy one share of Apple, right, you need to fork out $165. And you can see that, you know, earlier I mentioned that, you know, when you buy Apple, you're a part owner of the company, right? And you can see that your ownership stake, right? Let's say you buy you buy one share of Apple, right? It's 165 divided by this market cap, which is 793.46 billion. Okay, once you divide this, right, then you know how small your stake in Apple is. Okay, does it make sense? So 165 divided by 793 billion dollars, that is your stake in Apple. If you can't if you can't you know, just imagine the kind of, you know, minuteness, right, then. Okay, let me just just uh, break it down to another way. Let's say, right, let's say somehow you're a really rich individual, right? You buy a $7.93 billion worth of Apple stock. In other words, right, right now you own 10% of Apple shares, right? Just take $7.93 billion, assuming you, you buy this much of Apple, divide by $793 billion, which is the market cap, which is the total value of Apple, you get, right, 10% ownership ownership stake in Apple. So that's what I mean, right? By when you buy a stock, you're a part owner of the company. So you can check out this website, Finviz, right? A lot of financial data over here. But for now, let's move on, right? So a stock, right? You know that when you buy a stock, a stock, right? It's an ownership in a company. So a stock is traded on an exchange, right? An exchange like the New York Stock Exchange, Singapore Exchange, uh, London Stock Exchange. So depending on, you know, where you're from, right? Usually your own country would have an exchange, right, dedicated to trading stocks. So one thing to note is that there are many types of stocks out there. You know, they have stocks that, you know, focus on energy, stocks that are technology related. And if you want to break it down, right, there are pretty much about 11 different sectors that you can look at when trading stocks, okay? So within these sectors, you can further break up the different types of stocks, but we'll, we'll not go, you know, into too much details. Generally, you need to understand that stocks, they are traded across the different sectors and these are the 11 sectors that you know you might want to be aware of energy materials industrial consumer discretionary consumer staples healthcare financial information technology telecom utilities and real estate and this isn't the only way right to kind of you know classify stocks because you can also break them down according to their market cap otherwise known as their market capitalization so you can rank stocks according to how much they are worth like for example apple you saw earlier about 700 billion dollar company that's a mega cap. We call it a mega cap company. Uh, large cap is anything over $10 billion. 
mid cap company is between two and ten billion dollars small cap is between 300 and two billion dollars and micro cap is between 50 and 300 million dollars and finally nano capital nano cap right is below 50 million dollars and there's another one right which i did not, did not add it here it's called a penny stock right so penny stock is a, a stock right that's trading below five dollars they are usually the the micro cap nano cap or even a, sometimes even a small cap stocks so these are uh, what we call a penny stocks right stocks that are really you know trading at a very low price point usually below five dollars okay so these are the different type of stocks right you can classify them as well according to market cap so now why, why do you want to trade stocks okay well there are many reasons why you want to trade stocks maybe because you want to beat inflation right generally from where i'm from singapore inflation is about three or four percent a year so maybe by trading stocks i could earn like hey 10 percent a year I'm, I'm beating inflation right i'm protecting and growing my money and growing my wealth okay uh also you can you know some people they do trade stocks to earn a living to earn a second income right by you know trading stocks on a shorter term time frame right you know making anywhere from you know two percent four percent five percent a month they trade stocks to earn a living so that is possible as well so there are many reasons why you want to trade stocks and really right you have to ask yourself what is the purpose of this first and foremost right before you dive deeper because as you study later in the course you realize that there are different methods to trade stocks and different methods right have their own uh pros and cons to it but we'll get to that later but first and foremost right ask yourself why are you trading stocks in the first place and moving on right how to buy a stock so as mentioned right a stock is traded on, ex on an exchange it's not like forex where you know it's over the counter or forwards where it's you, you and the broker trading within one another no when you trade stocks right when you buy stocks you go through an exchange and just let me illustrate you know how it works so let's say you know this is a uh, you right okay you want to buy stock right you go to your broker Let's call it B. And your broker will then link to an exchange. So you can see that whenever you, you want to buy a stock, it goes to your broker and your broker then route your order to the exchange and, your, and then within a, a few seconds, the exchange will let you know whether your order is filled or not. Okay, so once the order is confirmed, the exchange sends the message back to your broker and then instantaneously or rather a while later, right, it will notify you on your trading platform that, hey, you know, your trade is filled. So that's how you buy a stock through a broker and a broker will then you know uh, get your order to the exchange so you can see that there are many diff different brokers around the world many different players right let's call this b this is b and there are other players let's call it uh, p right other you know other people who will trade or buy stocks okay so this as you can see right this little uh, mind map it expands can expand until really really huge and that's how you know uh the stock market works right they go to the broker they buy a share from the and then the broker, the broker routes the order to the exchange, get a confirmation, exchange goes back to the broker and then goes back to the uh, retail, like you and me. All right? So this is how you buy a stock. By having a broker to execute your trades for you on the exchange. Of course, there are, there are times where certain uh, people, they have the privilege to just directly get the order into the exchange, right? But most of you watching this video right now, it's unlikely that, you know, you will fall under that category. That's usually for institution, right? But hey, that is possible as well. So that's how generally you buy a stock, okay? So let's do a quick recap. Number one, a stock represents an ownership in a company, right? Number two, Stock is traded on an exchange, right? Depending where you're from, can be New York Stock Exchange, Singapore Exchange, and nowadays, right, with uh, uh, barriers breaking down, right? I'm from Singapore. I can easily trade U.S. stocks, uh, Philippine stocks, or whatsoever. It's, it's it's not difficult, right? Nowadays, you know, the barrier to entry is very low. Number three, we talk about the different types of stocks, right? By sectors, right? Whether it's energy, industrial, and stuff like that, or you can actually trade it or classify it under the different market cap, right? Meaning, you know, the size of the stocks, how valuable they are that's a market cap and finally right you buy stocks through a broker and then you will you know uh put your order to the exchange to let you know whether your know, order gets filled or not okay okay so moving on right let's discuss right on how you can actually profit from stock trading right there are two ways to do it number one buy low and sell high this is something that you probably have heard many times okay so just a quick example right this is the chart of apple let's say you know you buy low and sell high how it will look like is let's say you buy around here at 155 dollars and you sell and let's say at this highs over here which is about 175 dollars so the difference between your selling price and your buy price is 
$20. So you made a profit of $20 per share on Apple. Okay, so that's a profit of $20 per share on Apple. So this means is that, you know, if you buy 100 shares on Apple, your profit would then be $2,000. Just 20 multiplied by 100, your profit is $2,000, right? So we are talking from a individual share, one share basis, right? But if you are, you know, trading 500 shares or 1,000 shares, right, you just multiply the number of shares accordingly and you'll know what is your total profit. Okay, so this is just one example. Another way that you can profit, right, from stock trading is this. You buy high and sell higher. So this is a concept that is hardly talked about. Everybody talks about, you know, buying low, selling high, but this, right, is an even more important concept if you ask me. You buy high and sell higher. Okay, it's not a more important concept, but it's a, it's a concept that, you know, many traders just, you know, are unaware of it. So for this over here, right, what you're trying to do is that you want to buy high. Okay, so let's say, for example, over here, Apple, we have a breakout over here at this high. So let's say you buy at about 100 and let's make things simple. You buy at $185. And let's say true enough, right, Apple right, did break out and it staged a strong rally and it moved all the way up to, let's say, Again, just to make it simple, right? $200 over here, okay? So you buy at 185 and you sell at 200 Again, what is the profit? Just take your selling price minus your buying price and it's a profit of $15. So if you buy 1,000 shares, that's a pro profit of $15 multiplied by 1,000, which is $15,000. But this time around, right, you notice that the difference is that you are actually buying high, right? If you see this over here, from the looks of this chart, you might see that, man, you're buying at such a high price, right? The market is about to reverse. Okay, why are you buying such a high price? But here's the thing about the markets, right? You never know how high a stock can go. So that's why you, there's another way to profit, which is to, you know, buy high and sell higher. Because the market, right, could just as well, you know, break out and move, right, even further than your expectations or anyone else. So I know, right, sometimes it seems scary to be buying high. But hey, you never know, right? The stock could actually explode higher and become higher. So uh, don't worry about, you know, the precise entries, techniques, or when to sell. We'll cover all that later later in the course. But for now, I just want you to understand, right, the concepts, right, behind, you know, profiting in the stock market. You can buy low, sell high, or buy high and sell higher. Moving on, right, how do you actually calculate your stock trading returns, right? So there are three ways to do it. Number one, we call it the dollar uh, approach, right? So this is something that I've briefly covered earlier. So what you'll do is just to calculate the difference, right, between your selling price and buying price. And the difference is the profit, right, you've made in dollars. So again, let's say you buy at $150. You sell at $200. Okay, so your profit on a stock is $50 per share. So if you buy 1,000 shares, that profit is $50,000. Just the profit per share multiplied by the number of shares you've bought. Okay, so that is your dollar return. Next, percentage return, right? So this one is uh, a little bit different, but again, really simple stuff. So for example, let's say you buy Apple shares at $100. Okay, and you let's say you sell it at $150. So what is your percentage return? Just calculate your profit divided by your initial share price that you bought. So in this case, you can see that the profit is $50 per share. So just take $50, divide by the initial price of Apple shares that you bought, which is 100, and you get a profit of 50%. Simple, okay? And the last one, right, is what I call the R multiple, right? And this is actually my favorite approach to calculate your returns, whether you're trading Forex, options, or whatever, right? This is a more objective measure. Why is that? Because when you look at the dollar and percentage returns, it does not take into consideration your risk per trade. Okay, let me let me say that once again, right? When you calculate returns based on dollar or percentage, it does not calculate or determine right the amount of risk that you're taking to achieve those returns. So I'll explain. So let's say you buy Apple shares at $100. Okay, and let's say you sell it at uh, $150. And let's say for this particular trade of Apple, right, you're either going big or going home. You tell yourself that, you know, if Apple drops to, you know, $0, I'll still hold it. So you can see that your entire risk on this trade is a full $100. And your profit on this trade is $50. Okay, this is your full risk and this is your reward. So from a risk to reward standpoint, from a risk, right, let's call it from a risk to reward. 
you can see that you're actually risking, okay, a dollar to make 50 cents, right? How do you get that? Just very simple. You just divide this by 100, divide this by 100, and you realize that for that particular trade, you're risking $1 to make 50 cents. Okay, so this from a risk to reward standpoint is, uh, well, not too attractive if you ask me. Compare this now to another trader. Let's say, you know, this person, this trader now, he, he in fact, he makes less, right? Let's say, again, he buy Apple shares at $100. And this time around, right, he sell Apple at, let's say, only $110. But the difference between this trader now is that instead of risking that full $100 compared to trader A, now this trader B, okay, he has a stop loss. He has a predetermined price, right, where he'll get out of the Apple trade if things goes sour. Let's say that that stop loss, right, that exit price in his mind is $95. Okay. So now, from the looks of, thing, of things, right, ask yourself, what is this person risk per trade? Let's do this together. Okay, this person B, his risk per trade is, uh, let's see, uh, let's call it, the risk per trade is $5, right? $100, the initial buying price minus $95, which is the price that he'll get out if he's wrong. The difference is $5. What is his reward? Well, reward is very simple, right? The profit, right? The ending price that he sold minus his buying price, which is $10. So the reward is $10. So now, when you calculate it, right, from our multiple, his risk to reward, you can see that he's risking $5 to make $10, right? And if you just keep things simple, right? You realize that it's actually, he's actually risking a dollar to make $2. Compare that to the earlier trader who actually made more, who made $50 per share, right? But you look at it from a risk to reward standpoint, a person only made, uh, for every dollar he risked, he made 50 cents. Whereas for trader B, he risked a dollar to make $2. So which is a better trader? Which is a better trade? If you ask me from a risk to reward standpoint, from an R multiple standpoint, Trader B did a better trade. So you can look at it from two ways, right? Risking a dollar to make two dollars, or you can just call it a multiple of two R. When you talk about two R, you know that the person has risked a dollar to make two dollars. If someone made a profit of 10 R, this means that he risked a dollar to make ten dollars. Okay, so these are the three different ways to calculate your stock returns. I find that uh, the R multiple is the most objective measure to calculate your stock returns. So Let's do a quick recap. Number one, how to profit from stocks. You can either buy low or sell high or even do both. And number two, we talk about how to actually calculate your stock returns, right? Either through a dollar-based approach, a percentage approach, or the R multiple approach. And my favorite is the R multiple approach because it tells you, right, how much risk you're taking to achieve those uh, returns. All right? All right. So moving on, I want to share with you a few common stock trading terminologies that you'll probably, you know, come across. So if you understand what these means, right, then hey, you can just move on, right, and don't have to watch this video. But if you have no idea, you're clueless, then hey, pay attention. This is important. First thing first, what is long and short? So when you hear traders, you know, say that, hey, I'm long or I'm short, it simply means the direction of the trade that they are taking, right? When someone says he's long, it means that he will make a profit when the stock price goes up. So for example, let's say someone says, I'm long Apple shares at $100. It means he buy Apple shares at $100. And if Apple shares goes up to $120, he makes a profit of $20 per share. So that is what you mean by going long. On the other hand, right, when the trader says that I'm short, it means that he will make a profit if the stock price goes down. So how does this work? So when a trader is short, what actually happens is that he will borrow shares from the broker. So let's say, you know, I'm short Apple shares at 100 bucks. So I'm going to borrow $100 worth of share from my bro broker. Okay, I will borrow this $100 worth of share. And let's say uh, the stock price of Apple does goes down, right? Let's say it drops down to $90. Okay, so what will happen is that since I borrowed this $100 worth of share, I need to return back, right, the share of Apple because I borrowed one share of Apple. Now I need to return back this one share. So let's say I buy this one share of Apple at the open market for $90 and I return it back to my broker. <coughs> so in this case, or right, in this example, you can see that after the transaction is completed, I borrow the shares and I return back the share. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, 
I made a profit of $10 per share. Okay, so this is how short selling works, right? You borrow the shares, you sell it at the market, you collect the proceeds, although you won't really see it, right? Because the, the, the broker will manage all this transaction, right? And once you buy back the shares and return it back to your broker, you will then, you know, collect the difference. And in this case, since the stock price goes down, right? You make a profit of $10. But what if, right, the stock price goes up, it moves against you, right? Then the loss, right, will, will be, uh, I'll explain, right? Let's say you again, you shot $100 worth of Apple shares and it moves up to $200. This means, right, you collect $100 up front by borrowing the shares of Apple and then when you need to pay back the shares of Apple, you buy it at the open market for 200 bucks. So you can see that this is a loss of $100 to you because the price of the stock went against you. It went up higher. So one thing about short selling is that your losses is technically unlimited because what if the share price of Apple moves up to $500? $1,000, $10,000, you can see that your losses can, you know, exceed, right, your, even your initial deposit. So short selling, it's a, it's not a, it's a, it's not very common compared to traders who are usually long, but there is this so-called feature available, right, your broker might offer it. So again, if you want to dive deeper into short selling, this is something that you have to know. Okay, so with that said, moving on, what is a bit and ask? So when you are dealing in stock trading or or futures trading, right? You will see that a price, there's no one price in the market. There's, there's always two prices. Well, in fact, there can be more, right? But basically, there are two key prices that you have to pay attention to, the bid and the ask. So what this means is that the bid, right? If you want to, if you want to, let's talk about the ask first, right? The ask is simply, right? Let's say you want to buy a stock right now, okay? You have to look at the ask price because that is the price that you have to pay if you want to buy the stock right now. And on the other hand, if you want to sell the stock right now, you will pay attention to the bid price, right? This is the price that you can sell right now. Okay, so there's always two prices in the market, all right? The ask price and the bid price. The ask price is the price that if you want to buy the stock, that's the price you have to pay. The bid price is the price that you can sell right now if you want to sell a stock. So this is what we mean by the bid and ask. So what is the spread, right? The spread is simply means, right? The difference between the bid and the ask. So... Let me share with you an example. So let's say again, Apple stocks, right? That's the easiest to talk about, right? Let's say Apple has the asking price of $100 and 20 cents. That's the ask price, okay? And the bid price is $100 and 10 cents, for example. So the, the spread, right, of Apple right now is 10 cents, right? The difference between the ask and the bid. And that to you, my friend, right, is a transaction cost to you. This is a cost that you have to incur. Okay, because right now, if you think about this, if I buy Apple shares right now, I got to pay $100.20. And let's say the, the stock price didn't move and I want to sell it immediately, I can only sell it at $100.10. That is an immediate loss of $0.10 cent to you and that is the spread that you have to pay. And, that, and this is not even taking into consideration your commissions or fees to the exchange, etc. This is just the, the so-called the bid us spread, a transaction cost that is borne by you, the trader. Okay, and one thing to note is that Large cap stocks, right, they are typically more liquid. So this means that you can expect a tighter bid ask spread. So for example, let's say, I'm just giving a hypothetical example again, uh, say Apple, it's a large cap stock, right? So the spread over here, what I, I share with you is, let's say $100.20 is the ask and $100.10 is the bid. So this is the ask, this is the bid. And your bid ask spread is $0.10. Cents. A large cap stock, right, they are usually more liquid. You have a tighter bid ask spread. But let's say you deal with a, a small cap stock. They are usually less liquid and you can expect a larger bid ask spread. And this would be right a higher transaction cost to you. So for example, a stock of let's say $5.50, right? This is the ask, an example. And the bid is $5. So you can see that the bid ask spread now is 50 cents. And you have to, you know, uh, again, uh, realize that the more you trade these stocks, right? Uh, you know, buying and selling, right? You have to pay a larger bid ask spread and that would eat up into your returns. So this is something that you must know, okay? Usually the larger cap stocks, they are more liquid, the tighter the bid ask spread. And when you're trading smaller cap stocks, right, they are less liquid and the bid ask spread tends to be wider. And the reason is being because there's just lesser people trading the smaller cap stocks. So this is why, you know, uh, it's not as liquid, there are less orders in the market and that's why the, the spread tends to widen. Alright, so with that said, 
let's do a super quick recap. Number one, you've learned you know, what is long and short. It simply means, right, what is your trading direction? Number two, what is the bid and ask? The bid is the price that you can sell at right now. The ask is the price that you can buy at right now. And finally, we talk about the spread, right? What is the bid ask spread and how large cap stocks right, tend to have a tighter spread? And less liquid stocks, like, you know, small cap stocks, right? Their spread tends to be wider. Okay? Now, moving on, let's talk about the different types of orders. Okay? So when you are trading stocks, there are different types of orders that you can use in the market. And I just want to share with you some of the most common ones. There is, you know, more to this for that I'm about, I'm about to share with you, okay? But I'm not going to cover all of them because it's just uh, it's just too extensive. But these are the four most popular, most common ones that I feel that you should know. They are the market order, limit order, stop order, and stop loss order. So let me explain. Market order, what is it, right? So market order is simply an order, right, that sends to the market right now, immediately, right? At whatever the prevailing ask price is, you will buy it right now. So that's what we call a market order. It means that you want to enter the trade right now, so you use a market order. So the good thing about market order is that you know for sure that you'll be in the trade, okay? Guaranteed, right? You just hit the market order, the the uh, broker, right, would send the order to the exchange and get for you the best possible price. So you know for sure you will be in the trade. The downside to it is that you have to pay a premium. Okay, because you are willing to, you know, pay whatever the current prevailing price is. So if the stock is moving pretty fast, okay, you might have to pay a slightly higher price, a premium, right, at whatever the asking price is currently is. So this is the market order. Next is what we call the limit order. So a limit order is uh, where you will only get filled on the trade if the price comes to your desired level. So let's say, for example, again, Apple shares, all right? Let's say uh, the current price of Apple is trading at $110. And let's say, you know, you don't want to be hitting a market order because you have to pay $110. So instead, what you want to do is, or what you could do is place a buy limit order at $100. So what happens is that if, if, right, the price of Apple, it declines, right, to $100, then that buy limit order will get you filled at Apple shares, I mean, to buy Apple shares at $100. So this is what we mean by a limit order. You only enter the trade if the market comes to your desired price level. So this is good for those of you who you know who trade pull pullback, right? Uh, limit order is a useful uh, function that you can use. So the pros is that you know you enter at a cheaper price because you don't have to pay the the prevailing market price. You can actually wait for the market to come to a more cheaper price level before you enter the trade. The downside to it is that you might miss the move because what if apple right now is trading at 110 dollars and you have a buy limit at 100 dollars but apple doesn't you know decline it moves to 120 130 150 200 500 and you end up missing the move right because you want to enter at a cheaper price so that's the downside the first downside the second downside is that you are you know trading against the current momentum so what this means is that let's say you know apple price is at here right now Okay, at, let's say this is again $110 and you have an order over here at this $100 level. So what you're actually doing is that you're buying Apple, right? As the current momentum is against you, right? It's against you. It's not necessarily anything bad, but this is something that, again, I just want you to know that is, you, is that you will be entering your trade, right? When the current momentum is against you. Okay, so that's so-called a couple of, you know, uh, cons that you might want to be aware of. So that is the limit order. The third thing is what we call a stop order. So a stop order is useful, right? When you want to trade breakout because you will only enter trades as the market moves in your favor. So for example, okay, uh, let's say the Apple shares has been in a range, okay? Let's say the highs of the range is uh, $100 and the lows is, let's say, $80. So if you use a stop order, right, you can put in a stop order at, let's say, $105, right? Over here, $105. This means, right, is that this means right that only if Apple shares move up and hits $105, only then will you buy the shares. So this is what we call a buy stop or buy stop order. You only go long, right? If the share price moves in your favor, right? And it hits a predetermined level that you you expect. Okay? So if you have a buy stop order at $105, you will only buy 
the shares if Apple reaches 105. If it reaches 101, 102, 103, 104, you will not buy the shares. It only buys, right, when it hits $105, right? So this is what we mean by a buy stop order. So the pros is that when you are using a stop order, a buy stop order, for example, you are entering your trades with momentum. So you can see that this is actually the opposite, right, of the limit order. So when you buy a breakout, right, let's say you have a buy order over here, you're buying, right, as momentum, momentum, right, is in your favor. The downside to trading with a stop order is that it might be a false breakout. So what is a false breakout? So the stock price might, you know, go up, go down, go up, go down. It breaks out and then it collapses back into the range. So you end up, you know, buying at the highs over here. So this could happen, right? So again, I just want to, you know, I want you to be aware of it. Okay, so this is the stop order. And finally, it's something what we call the stop loss order, possibly the most important order that you'll use. So stop loss order is uh, unlike the earlier three orders where it gets you into the trade. A stop loss order gets you out of the trade. Okay, you exit the trade if the price goes against you. So you can think of this like a defense mechanism, right? If the stock price goes against you, after you hit a certain price level, you're out of the trade. So again, an example, let's say you buy a, uh, you buy Apple shares at, at this point, right? Maybe it's a uh, hundred bucks and you have a stop loss order at, let's say $70. So what this means is that if Apple shares, it declines, right? To $70 at this point, you will automatically sell Apple shares because your stop loss is at $70, right? So this is a, uh, an order, right, that helps you, uh, so-called, protects your trading account. It, it prevents you from, you know, getting things out of hand. Okay, it's a defense mechanism. So the pros is that, you know, you cut your losses, you get to live another day, you, you don't have to, you know, lose a huge chunk of capital because your stop loss, you know, prevents further damage. But the cons of it is that, you know, the market could reverse back in your favor. So, you know, let's say, again, market, you know, goes up, Okay, you buy over here, your stop loss is here. Market comes down, hit your stop loss, and then continues higher. So when it hits your stop loss, right, it could reverse back in your direction. So you can see that, you know, man, if I did not use a stop loss, right, I wouldn't have taken the loss. So that, that's definitely going to hit your mind, right? But trust me, right, in the long run, it's for you, it's for your own good. Because what if, what if, right, the stock price just collapses lower and never recovers? So again, stop loss, as I've said, right, it's a defense mechanism. It's not 100% foolproof. There will be times where the market hits your stop loss and then it moves back in your favor. And that's simply the cost of trading, the cost of doing business. Okay, so a stop loss order is unique in the sense that it's uh, an order that gets you out of the trade. So a recap, number one, we talk about market order. It gets you into the trade, gets you into the market right now. You simply buy at whatever the asking price is. A limit order is an uh, order that gets you at a cheaper price. You set a determined uh, price level that you want to enter, and if the market declines to that level, you'll enter the trade. That's a limit order. A stop order is the uh, opposite of a limit order. You only enter the trade if the market moves enough in your favor at whatever price level that you determine, right? So a stop order is basically trying to buy a breakout if the price has moved so much distance within this period of time, your stop order will get you into the trade. And finally, we talk about stop loss order is simply an order that gets you out of the trade to protect you and your trading account. All right. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about how to analyze a stock. So there are two main ways to analyze a stock, fundamental analysis and technical analysis. So you can think of it as this way, right? Fundamental analysis tells you what to buy. Technical analysis tells you when to buy. Okay, so for now, we are focusing on the fundamental aspect. Don't worry, we will discuss about technical analysis in the later videos, but for now, let's uh, begin with fundamental, shall we? So when you talk about fundamental analysis, right, it can be broken down into two categories, qualitative fundamentals and quantitative fundamentals. So here's the thing about fundamentals, right? What you're trying to do is to gather insights, information, right? Maybe from the economy, from the financial statements, uh, from the company itself to derive an intrinsic value for the company, right? This is what fundamental analysts try to do, right? To derive an intrinsic value of the company. And then if the stock price drops below the intrinsic value, you buy. If the stock price is above the intrinsic value, you sell, right? That pretty much, right, sums up the role 
of someone right trying to you know use fundamental analysis in their investment or in their trading so again as mentioned right there are two broad ways to do fundamental analysis qualitative fundamental analysis and quantitative fundamental analysis so let's have a look at them right in more details so when you talk about qualitative fundamental analysis right these are fundamentals or rather information that can't be quantified for example disruption right that we are experiencing right now this is qualitative analysis that can't be quantified like for example let's let me give you an example uh let's say i have an oil company right now i'm profit right as you know i send my my guys to dig up oil from the earth let's say you know there is this new uh commodity that can replace oil maybe you know there is a less uh less uh, hazard okay it's cheaper and it can replace oil right in vehicles in machinery and stuff like that so when this new commodity comes to the market okay you can see that my business is going to suffer because nobody needs oil anymore my stock price is going to collapse so how do you actually you know so-called quantify this you can't right so this is why we call it qualitative analysis this is an insight right that someone can glean from right and realize that you know this would be disruptive to the oil stock so maybe they might want to sell the stock or even short the stocks altogether so this is an example of qualitative fundamental analysis another one could be economic mode right like you know what warren buffett uh, is a term that i think warren buffett came up with an economic mode so for example coca-cola they have a strong economic mode they sell soda they sell cola but if you want to challenge against them can be pretty darn difficult right because they have the brand they have the reputation they've been in business for a long time so they have a strong economic mode all right and this is another aspect of qualitative analysis you can't really quantify what this economic mode is you know what it is right it's their branding their trust they have been in business for a long time and their recipe is pretty much you know uh, kept somewhere as a secret so that is an economic mode and that's another way of you know looking at qualitative analysis or even management it can be you know a qualitative aspect as well maybe a good management a good ceo comes in to you know uh, uh improve on things improve on the operations reduce expense you know gain new market share in different uh, uh industry or sectors for example all this is what we call qualitative analysis things that cannot be quantified in numbers and moving on we have something what we call quantitative analysis so this is fundamentals that can be quantified stuff like you know your assets you know what your assets are your machinery you can quantify all those you can put a value on those assets your liabilities right your revenue your earnings your cash flow these are all stuff that can be quantified and this is why we call it a quantitative analysis so when you deal with quantitative analysis you will see ratios like you know your pe ratio your price to earnings ratio your pb ratio price to book value price to cash flow and etc so this is what we mean by quantitative analysis so as a recap right there are two types of analysis qualitative and quantitative and i just want to talk a little bit now about the pros and cons between you know, both of this approach so for qualitative fundamental analysis right the the pros of it is that you know if you can so-called digest information you can make sense of you know what's going on in the world in the company you can gain insight that you know not many traders or investors will see and you can actually make a profit right because you can actually buy a stock below its intrinsic value so that's the the good thing about qualitative analysis the downside to it is that it is difficult i'll be honest right because there is so much information out there how do you know what's relevant to the market at this current point in time so you will get uh, analysis paralysis analysis paralysis there's so much information you don't know which are stuff that you should focus on or which are stuff that is noise in the market so you know those are the pros and cons for qualitative analysis quantitative analysis again uh, the pros is that it can be quantified you can actually use quantified data and backtest and see whether you know that uh, data actually yields you a market beating return in the long run for example right it's proven that value stocks right stocks that have a low price to book value they tend to outperform the market okay so this means if that if you rank a stocks between those with the highest book value and those with the lowest book value right if you buy the the top 10 top, top 10 worst uh stocks right with the lowest price to book value they tend to outperform over the next few years compared to stocks with high price to book value they tend to underperform the market over the next few years so you can see that quantitative analysis uh the good thing is it can be quantified and can give you an edge in the market so you don't really need to know uh or have great insights into a company because uh using raw price data you can actually know what works and what don't 
Uh, the downside to quantitative analysis, again, similar to qualitative, is that sometimes there's just so much information and it's you know very hard to filter out you know what are the stuff out there that matters and what don't matter. Okay, so again, if you ask me, right, qualitative or quantitative, I won't say there's right or wrong, but I do know that quantitative fundamental analysis you can do back tests on it, and you can know right which are the key matrix right that are worth paying attention to. So this is just my my take between qualitative and quantitative analysis all right okay so now let's talk about you know what are some of the fundamental matrix that you should pay attention to as a trader so based on studying you know momentum stock traders and also if you've read the book how to make money in stocks by william j o'neill you know that stock traders they like to focus on earnings and net income why is that okay so as mentioned earlier when you look at qualitative fundamental analysis right most stock traders, they just don't have the skill to, you know, analyze the company to know, you know, what is the noise and what is the signal. But one thing that they can do to shortcut, right, their so-called screening process is by looking at earnings and net income. Why? If you think about this, right, a company that's about to disrupt a sector, let's say, you know, again, uh, back to the example where there is this new element or material that can replace oil. If it comes into the market and nobody buys oil anymore and buys this new element because it's cheaper, it's better, and it's more efficient, and it doesn't contribute to you know uh, global warming, you can be sure that you know people will flock to whichever company that's producing, let's call it element X, and this company will make money, right? Their earnings will increase because they are you know selling or you know uh, what do you call it, uh, mining for a lot of this new element X. Earnings will increase, net income will increase, right? If they are able to keep their operation cost low. So you can see that earnings and net incomes would reflect the fundamental of a company, right? That, you know, maybe they are a new innovator. They are coming up with something new in the market that is in demand, right? So that's one example. Another example could be, let's say a company has been in decline. Maybe it lost its competitive edge, right? It has dropped 90%, right? The stock price has dropped 90% from the highs. And then new management comes in. This new management starts to, you know, shake things up, right? It fire off the, you know, underperforming workers. It, it uh, removes underperforming assets and, and focus on the stuff that is bringing in revenue and focus on stuff that actually, you know, helps the company uh, uh, re get back its age and to help the company grow. Now, from a qualitative perspective, uh, it can be quite difficult to determine whether that new management, the new CEO who comes in is able to turn things around. But one thing that don't lie is the earnings and net income. Okay, if it comes in and earnings starts to improve, net income starts to improve, quarter on quarter, year on year, you can be sure that, you know, clearly the management is doing something right. So when you see earnings is improving, net income is improving, chances are, I'm not saying guarantee because there's many cases of fraud, right? But chances are the fundamentals of the company is, you know, doing okay as well. It could be even a turnaround or an, a new innovation in the uh, company. And whatever the case is, right, as a stock trader, if you want to, you know, buy stocks, right, you want to focus on stocks that have improved earnings and net income because this tells you, right, there's a good chance that the fundamentals in the company is pretty all right, it's pretty good even. Okay, so earnings and net income is what many stock traders, they pay attention to. They pay attention to how the earnings have increased quarter on quarter or how the earnings have increased year on year, right, both earnings and net income. So this, for you, a stock trader, this is something that you want to pay attention to. Two. okay so in this section i'll go into technical analysis for stock trading so one thing to point out is that technical analysis there is a lot of stuff a lot of information out there you have you know things like pivot points rsi macd moving average support resistance trend line trend channel and candlestick patterns and much much more and my goal right now over here is not to teach you everything about technical analysis. I can't do that. Instead, what I'll do is to focus, all right, to get you focused on the key areas of technical analysis that matters. That's all I'm going to do, right? To give you a strong foundation into technical analysis. And then from then on, if you want to explore further, you have the tools, the knowledge, right, to, you know, go about doing it. Okay, so when you are dealing with technical analysis, right, let's say in stock trading, Right, you know that fundamentals, they are good, right? It helps you to filter down the list of stocks that you want to trade, right? Focusing on, you know, uh, companies with strong or good fundamentals. Technical analysis, on the other hand, can help you to time your entries, telling you when to buy, right? So tell, fundamentals tells you what to buy. Technical analysis can tell you when to buy. So when you are dealing with a technical analysis, there are three broad categories that I want you to know. It's what I call the trend. 
the area of value and entry trigger. So let's analyze them right in depth. So a trend, right? You've probably you know heard of a trend, right? So what is a trend? A trend is simply right on your chart. It looks like you know higher highs and higher lows, like this. Okay, let me just draw this right. Higher highs and higher lows. So this is what we call an uptrend because you can see that the price right is making higher highs and higher lows. And one thing to note is that when we are dealing with technical analysis, when a stock is in an uptrend, we want to be a buyer because we assume right that there's a good chance that the stock would continue to trend higher. So this is uh, an example of an uptrend. So the opposite of an uptrend, right, it's a downtrend which looks like this. It has lower highs and lower lows. So when a stock is in a downtrend, right, we want to be selling, we don't want to be buying because, you know, again, right, there's a good chance that the stock will continue trending lower so one of the uh, important principle that you want to take away is that whenever you want to buy stocks right you want to buy stocks that are at least in an uptrend or at least right don't buy stocks in a downtrend especially for trading right this is not investing where you know you're going to hold on for years and years in trading right you are going to enter the markets and you'll pretty much exit right in a i would say in a short after a short while depending on your your time frame but you won't be holding stocks for a long time so again First fundamental rule of stock trading is again, don't buy stocks in a downtrend. And one tip to share with you is that to define a trend, right? You can use the 200 period moving average, right? To help you, you know, define the trend. So let me share with you an example. So the 200 period moving average is just an indicator. You can get it on most charting platform, right? Just select 200, right? And over here, this black line is what we call the 200 period moving average. So I've applied this to the daily time frame on Amazon. And you can see that right now, the price of Amazon, right? This is the price or over here. There's movements. This is the price of Amazon. It's above the 200 MA. So when you see the price is above the 200 MA, right? It gives you a bias that, hey, you know, I want to be buying only in this market because the market is in an uptrend. Okay, and vice versa, right? If the price over here, the price is below the 200 MA, then you can conclude that, you know, the uh, market is weak, right? And you either want to be selling, right? Or, you know, hold on to cash. You don't want to be buying in a downtrend. Of course, there are exceptions, right? Especially traders who are, you know, more advanced in their trading methodologies. They are more experienced. They can, you know, buy in a downtrend. They can still make money. But for you, if you're still new to trading this, this rule over here, right, will keep you on the right side of the markets more often than not, okay? This is not foolproof, but hey, you know, it will keep you on the right side of the markets more often than not, okay? So this is what I talk about, uh, what we have discussed, right, the trend. Next thing, area of value. So you know that trend, right, tells you whether the stock is moving up higher or lower. But just because a stock is moving up higher doesn't mean you, you buy it immediately, okay? Just because you see... Uh, oranges in a supermarket that's that's uh, selling right now, you don't buy the oranges immediately because maybe, you know, the oranges is uh, overpriced. Maybe the oranges is selling like one orange for $10. You don't buy one orange for $10, right? Because during a sale, you can buy maybe three oranges for $2. So you want to wait when the price is at an area of value for your oranges. And this is the same for trading, right? You don't want to buy just because the stock price is high. It's in an uptrend. No, you want it to come to an area of value before you consider buying okay and it's the same for trading so how do you sort of you know define what is value in trading so these are a few techniques that you can use support and resistance trend line moving average right i find that these three they are they are pretty easy to understand and use there are more out there again but i would say these three right really right is more than enough to get you started so let me explain you know what are these uh different tools that you can use so support, right? You can think of support as a floor, right? Where the price have difficulty, you know, going under, like a like a floor. So you can see that over here, okay. I want you to think of this floor as a wooden floor. It means it can provide some uh, support, right, to push the price higher. But it's made of wood, so wood can also break. So don't think that you no, know, just because the price is coming to an area of support, right, it will definitely bounce. No, you know, wood. Wood can break. It's not titanium. It's not metal, right? It can break. So that is how I want you to think of support. So in this case, right, you can see that over here, we have an area of support over here. Price bounced once, rallied higher, came back down under, bounced a second time, and rallied higher. So you can see that support is an area. It's not a fine line on your chart. So this depicts it pretty clearly. You can see that over here, this, uh, this whole area, 
is an area of support. It's not just one line, even though I, I draw it as a line because that's my preference, but you have to treat it as an area, meaning that the price could come into an area of support and then bounce off away. It could come deeper into that area of support and then reverse from there. That is possible as well. So remember, support is an area on your chart. Treat it like a piece of you know a wooden plank, okay? The second thing that I want to share is a trend line. So trend line is like support, right? Like support and resistance. But the difference is that support is horizontal. A trend line is, uh, what do you call this? Diagonal, okay? So trend line is diagonal. So you can see that again, it's an area. This is the area over here. And notice the price bounce here, uh, the second bounce here and the third bounce over here. Okay, so this is again a trend line. When you want to buy stock, again, you want to buy when the price is near an area of support, you want to buy it right when the price is near the uh, upward trend line, right? Because this represents an area of value on your charts. And the last thing to share is a uh, moving average. Okay, so you know that there are many types of moving average out there. Like for example, earlier I shared with you the 200 period moving average, how it can help you define the long term trend. However, you know, that's not the only moving average you can use. You can use the 20, 50 or 100 and all these different moving average, right? They help you, uh, uh, they have different purpose. Like for example, I like to use the 50 MA, okay, which is what you see over here to help you, to help me define an area of value. So you can see that uh, for this particular chart of Nike, the daily time frame, the price tends to, you know, bounce off the 50 MA, you know, uh, repeatedly for over the last few times. So needless to say, right, if the trend is very strong, it may not retrace back towards the 50 MA. Sometimes it might just bounce off the 10 or 20 MA and it'll continue trading higher. If the trend is a healthy trend like what you are seeing right now, right where the pullbacks are more obvious, it tends to find support at the 50 MA. And if the trend is, let's say, not very strong, pretty, uh, it's just weak, right? It can even pull back to the 100 or 200 MA. Okay, so again, moving average is another technique that, technique that you can use to, be, uh, to define your area of value. So, one thing to note is that let's say, for example, the stock right now, it's uh, let's say it's trading at this highs over here. Okay, you, okay, let me just give it an example. How about the stock is at this highs over here? Let's say you know, the stock, previously it has respected the 50 MA and now it just breaks out higher and got this slight price rejection. At this point, you don't necessarily want to be buying over here. Why is that? Because remember, you want to buy in an uptrend and from an area of value. Right now, the price is not at this area of value, which is at this 50 MA over here. So it's much better right, to be patient and let the price come to you, come to an area of value, and then you look to enter your trade. So now the question is, you know, when exactly do you enter the trade, right? Let's say the market is in, in an uptrend, it's an area of value, do you just buy it immediately? No, right? Because you can actually use something, what I call an entry trigger to time your entry. So entry trigger, right? Uh, I find that candlestick patterns, they are very useful for this purpose. Okay, and you can use, you know, reversal candlestick patterns like the hammer, the engulfing pattern, bullish engulfing, bearish engulfing, and shooting star and stuff like that. So if you don't understand, right, I'm just going to, you know, run you through quickly, right, about candlestick patterns, right? And these are different reversal candlestick patterns, which I find that is useful to know for your trading. So how do you read a candlestick pattern? So candlestick pattern, right, it's a recap, right? It's uh, useful for an entry trigger to help you time your entry. And to read a candlestick pattern is that you would usually see, you know, two types of candles. It's green or red. So if the candle is green, right, this over here right, is the opening price. Okay, and this over here is the closing price. So this means the market, the price open at this level went all the way up higher. This is the high for the day. For example, let's say you're looking at the daily time frame. This is the high of the day and then finally closing near the, high, the highs over here. You can see this lower shadow. This is called the uh, wick, lower wick, right? This tells you the low of the day or the low of the candle. Okay, so these are, there's only four things to know. The high, the open, the high of the candle and the low of the candle. So when you look at the bearish candle, it's the opposite, right? The open right now is on top, okay? And the close is below. That's why it's bearish, right? Because the, the price, right, has actually closed lower for the day. So now this candle is in red color. Again, this is the high of the day. And this is the low of the day. So this is how you read candlestick pattern. And moving on, right? There are many differences. I mean, many different type of candlestick patterns out there. But I find that a few that are worth knowing, right, is, uh, for example, the hammer and shooting star. 
So let me just explain to you, right? So again, this is a green candle. Okay, you can see that the price opens over here, right? The open for green candle, right? Bullish candle, the open is always below the close. So this is where the price open. And when it open, right, notice that there is this long lower wick over here. So what it tells you is that the, during the day, the sellers actually came in and pushed the price down all the way down lower to this point. Somehow, you know, they couldn't push the price lower anymore and the buyers came in to control. Okay, they're on roids, steroids, right? And they pushed the price up all the way up higher and finally closing near the highs over here. So what does this tell you? This tells you that, hey, you know, buyers are stepping in, right? They have managed to, you know, uh, take control from the sellers and push the price up, closing above the open. So this is a sign of strength, right? Telling you that the buyers are in control. And that's why you get a candlestick pattern like this, which is what we call a hammer. Tung tung, hammer. So on the other hand, right, a shooting star. A shooting star is just the opposite of a hammer. You can see that again, this is candle is uh, it's bearish, it's red. So the open is here, right? When the market opened, buyers took control, pushed the price up higher, up to the highs of this, uh, this, this, uh, this day over here. Suddenly, the sellers, you know, said, hey, that's enough, that's enough, I'm coming in. And it's, bam, they smashed the price lower all the way down to the lows over here and finally closing near the lows. So this is the open, this is the close, this is the low, and this is the high. So again, a shooting star, if you read this, right, this is a, a sign of weakness because it tells you that the buyers, they are no longer in control. The sellers are in control and that's why they can, you know, uh, push the price lower for the day. Okay, so this is hammer and shooting star. Another couple of candlestick patterns that you should know, right, is uh, what we call the bullish engulfing and bearish engulfing. So it's very similar to hammer and shooting star, just that this time around it's in the form of two candlestick patterns, right? There's, there are two candlestick patterns, two candlestick patterns, whereas earlier you just saw, right, it's just one individual candlestick pattern. But the message behind it is pretty much the same. If you look at this one over here, it's what we call the bullish engulfing pattern, right? Sellers to control and close near the lows over here, right? It opens here and close near the lows. The next candle, buyers open near the lows and took control and push the price all the way up higher. Closing, right, even above, right, the prior candle high over here, right? This is a sign of strength, right? Showing that, you know, sellers took control, they pushed down the price lower and then suddenly, da -da -da, buyers came in, pushed the price up higher and finally closing near the highs. So this is a sign of strength as it tells you that the buyers are in control. On the other hand, right, bearish engulfing pattern is just the opposite, right? Buyers on this first candle, they are in control. This is the opening price. They come up all the way up higher and close near the highs of the day. Remember what is this? This is the high of the day and this is the low of the day. Then the subsequent candle, this candle over here, the sellers, they open near the highs and suddenly, suddenly, I don't know where they find the strength, right? Maybe, you know, it took too much creatine, steroids and protein shake. Bam, right? They smashed the price lower and finally closing near the low of the day. So this tells you that now the sellers are in control. And this is what we call a bearish engulfing pattern. Okay, so you can call the uh, hammer shooting star bullish engulfing bearish engulfing as you know reversal candlestick patterns because they sort of you know help you uh, time you know uh, market reversals or market turning points okay but you don't just want to blindly trade them just because you see a bearish engulfing doesn't mean you short doesn't doesn't mean you see a bullish engulfing you buy immediately no you don't do that right you want to use a few technical tools together right to increase the odds right of your trade working out which is what we're going to discuss right now So I want to introduce to you what I call the Tay framework. Okay, so this is a framework that I came up with. So again, we are just going to combine what you have learned so far. Number one is the trend. So you recall earlier, if the price is above the 200 period moving average, chances are right, it's in an uptrend and you want to have a long bias, meaning you want to be buying the stock only. You don't want to short sell the stock, okay, if the market is above the 200 MA. Similarly, if the price is below the 200 period moving average, you want to have a short bias. And if you cannot short, right, at least you don't want to be buying when the price is below the 200 period moving average. Okay, so this gives you a bias to know whether you should be buying or whether you should stay on the sidelines, meaning, you know, you'll stay out, stay out of the markets. Okay, because short selling is something that it's, uh, I would say it's more advanced. Uh, uh, not all of you can, you know, short sell the stock market. So again, uh, just, just uh, know where I'm coming from. Second thing, area of value. We mentioned earlier, just because the stock is in an uptrend doesn't mean you want to buy. 
Just because there are oranges selling in the supermarket doesn't mean you buy that orange, right? If it's one orange for $10, $100, are you going to buy? Well, I, I won't buy. I'm, I'm a cheap skate. I want to buy when it's, you know, two for $3. One for five, I mean, five for $1, maybe even. I mean, two for $3. I mean, three for $2. Or maybe five for $1. I I'll buy when it's uh, it's cheap, when it's uh, when it's uh, of value to me, okay? Because uh, I'm not really a huge fan of orange, right? So it has to be at a value price before I buy those oranges. And it's the same for trading. You don't want to buy just because the market is in an uptrend, just because the price is high. You want to buy it when it's trading from an area of value. An area of value can be defined as, you know, support resistance, moving average, trend line, right? Stuff that we've covered earlier. And then, right, the, the last thing that we want to look at is entry trigger. We want to look, right, at the price and tell us that, you know, hey, you know, the buyers are now in control and now is, you know, a safer time to enter the trade. That's how, you know, candlestick patterns can help you, right? Where it shows you patterns like the hammer, the bullish engulfing pattern. It tells you that now the buyers have stepped in, right? And there's a good chance the market could reverse higher. So this is the Tay framework. Combining these three, right? And you can actually have, you know, tradable, right? Or trading opportunities, right? That you can trade off using technical analysis. So here's an example, okay? So you can see over here, the price above the 200 MA. So should you be buying or selling? Buying, I hope you said buying, buying. Yeah, buying, right? You should be buying. Okay, so now the price is above the 200 MA, you should be buying. Do you buy it over here? Do you buy it over here? Or do you buy it over here? I think Reynard said something about trading from an area of value. That's right, area of value. So where is an area of value on the chart? So uh, from the looks of it, right, you can see that over here, previous support, Sorry, previous resistance now turned support and now becomes support. And the price came into this area of support. That's great. We have the uptrend. We have an area of support. The third thing we're looking for to tell us that the buyers are now in control. I think this looks like a bullish engulfing pattern. Yeah, it looks like a bullish engulfing pattern. Hey, there you have it, right? Uptrend, area of value, and a bullish reversal candlestick pattern. So this, right, it's a... It's a a trading opportunity that you can take advantage of. You can buy on the next candles open. Your stop loss could go a distance below this low, right? And and you know, hopefully, you know, right, the market moves right in your favor from this uh this entry point. So we're not going to discuss too much about you know uh where to take profits and stuff like that because this is really just the beginner's uh, uh introduction to stock trading. But I hope I gave you all right a good understanding, a foundation right to know when to buy a stock. Okay, so this is one example of the Tay framework. Another one over here, you can see that again, uh, the price now above the 200 MA. Should you be buying or selling? 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 No, buying, right? That's right, buying. So where is the area of value? In this case, we notice that, right, hey, this trend line seems to be an area of value, right? Market bounce off here a uh, second time, and on the third attempt, right, it, it bounce off and it form a hammer. So look at this candlestick pattern. Notice the price over here, it opened at this uh, the lows. Okay, the below the low of the prior day, came all the way down lower, and then the sellers, you know, said, "Hey, that's enough, right? That's enough," and they pushed the price all the way up higher, closing near this highs of the day. On top of it, you are trading or you're buying in an uptrend at from this area of value on this trend line support. Okay, so you can see that uh, in this case, right? Yep, uh, the market that did went higher from here. So one thing to share is that all the charts that I'm sharing with you right now, they are cherry pick. I repeat, they are cherry pick. So I've purposely pick those charts, right, that shows you winning trades because I find that it's easier to explain the concept. But when you're trading in the live markets, right, trust me, there will be losers. <laughs> yes, there will be losers, right? So I want you to prepare for it, all right? So the, all these examples, right, is just to let you understand the concept easily, right? Because it's, it's much easier to explain. But when you're trading live, okay, or even when you're paper trading, right, there will be losses no matter how fantastic your analysis is, no matter how good the fundamentals, how good the technicals, there will still be losses. Embrace it. But don't worry. In the later section, we'll talk about risk management. All right. So that, you know, even if you have a loss, right, it's not the end of the world yet. All right. So that's uh, that's later. Uh, for now, I still want to, you know, share with you more examples, right, of this uh, Tay framework because it's it's powerful. So let's have a look, okay, uh, at the Tay framework. So this is the chart of Google, right? You can see over here, Google. And uh, let's see. Uh, let me find it. Okay. 
So you can see that again, right, uh, this time round, notice that if I just zoom out a little, the 200 MA now acts as an area of value. So prior to this, right, I said that you know, the 50 MA, you know, can act as an area of value. But in this case, right, the trend of this uh, this stock, right, it's uh, it's not as strong, right? So it tends to find support, right, at this 200 MA, 200 MA, here and here as well. Again, the concept is still the same, right? Stock is in an uptrend. It's at an area of value. And then what, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? Well, we can look for a candlestick pattern, right, as an entry trigger to enter the trade. So in this case, we have something what we call, in this case, right, it's uh, again, this is something like a, a hammer. Price, right, hit down lower, buyers to control and close near the highs over here. Right, you can enter on the next candle, open over here, right, and go long, meaning you buy the stock. Another opportunity over here, right, price came down from this hammer, right, this hammer at this uh, 200 MA and an area of value. In this case, it might be a losing trade. Again, this is a good example of a losing trade as the price just, you know, continue lower, all right, might stop you out and then reverse from here. So this is really the reality of trading. No matter how good the setup is, right, there will be losses. Okay, so let's have a look at an another example. Uh, how about this? COST. Okay, weekly time frame. So this time around, I just pull out the 50 MA. Okay, so you notice over here, this is the chart of COST, Wholesale Corp. This is the weekly time frame. And again, right, no, it doesn't matter what time frame you're trading, whether the weekly, the daily, the 15 minutes, right? The concepts, right, is a, can be applied the same. So in this case, right, Costco, Wholesale Corp, can see that it's been respecting the 50 MA. Right, if I pull out the 200 MA, I can guarantee you that the price is above the 200 MA as well. Right, so just get out the 200 MA. Notice that the price is above the 200 MA. So you want to be a buyer. So now, where is an area of value to trade from? Okay, so area of value could be the 50 week moving average. Price has, you know, bounced once, twice, thrice, four times. And let's say, right, you, you miss this move over here. And over here, you have this huge spike over here. Again, this is a, it's a bullish reversal, right? Price open near the uh, open and the lows, okay? Came down at this point at uh, around $117 at one point before the buyers finally stepped in, pushed price and closed near the highs over here. So you can see that this is a huge, huge, right? Uh, bullish reversal candlestick pattern. You may or may not trade it, right? But in this case, right, the, the, the market, the price did went higher from here. But this is a very huge uh, bullish reversal candlestick pattern. Again, the concepts is the same. Trend, area of value, entry trigger. Uh, let's have a look at one more, shall we? Something that is uh, familiar with us. Facebook. Okay. Uh, Facebook. Okay, in this case, again, the price above the 200 MA. Let's say, you know, it bounced off the 50 MA quite a number of times here. One, twice, and over here, three times, third, third time. So over here, I can see that how the candlestick pattern uh, is useful to help you time your entries. That notice over here, right, there really isn't any valid entry trigger right this is not a hammer or a bullish engulfing this over here is uh not necessarily a bullish engulfing i think it's more of a piercing pattern i would say the this candle over here right is the closest to a bullish engulfing by right theoretically right a bullish engulfing should the lows right should be below the prior candle lows somewhere here and then it engulfs the previous candle and then close near the highs right i would say this is the closest because again uh the range of the candle is large showing you conviction from the bias right in this case uh, i would say this would be the closest to a bullish engulfing although it's not really right a textbook bullish engulfing but if you can read price action right you know that over here this one is a sign of strength uh we have volatility contraction meaning the market went quiet for a while and on this candle boom right uh buyers came in to control and you know close near the highs over here right so anyway right, this is a, a an example of a not really a textbook example but showing you that from an area of value right and then waiting for a candlestick reversal candlestick pattern to go long sometimes you may not get the exact textbook setup or example and that's where your price action reading of the markets would come into play right another one i would say is more straightforward would be this one over here so this one over here the price okay so one thing to share again right the 50 ma the area of value it's never a line on your chart it's always an area so you can see that over here it pretty much breached below the 50 MA and then on this candle form a hammer and then close back above the 50 MA, right? Giving you a bullish hammer to go long to buy. Okay, so this is another point that I want to share with you, right? That your area of value on your chart, it's always an area. So I hope this uh, this gives you a few examples, right? Of the Tay framework that I've just shared with you. So as a recap, right? Here's what 
you've learned so far, we have you know covered quite a bit. Number one, we talk about trend, right? You want to be buying in an uptrend and selling in a downtrend. If you can't sell in a downtrend, you cannot short. At least you know, don't buy in a downtrend. Stay in cash. Number two, we spoke about area of value, right? You don't want to buy just because the stock is in an uptrend. You want it to come to an area of value, okay? Uh, one thing to mention is that for me personally, I don't always trade from an in area of value. Sometimes I do trade breakouts, but that's another topic altogether. But, but for you, for you right now, for starters, right, I would say it's much, you know, uh, it's better to be trading from an area of value, right? Buying it when things are cheap. And area of value can be in the form of support and resistance, moving average, trend line, right? We shared quite a number of examples earlier. The third thing is entry trigger, right? Uh, using candlestick patterns, right? To help you time your entry, to show you that, you know, the buyers are now in control or the sellers are now in control, right? So candlestick patterns gives you clues, right? To let you know who is in control. And finally, right? We combine all these three different uh, so-called uh, uh, principles, if you want to call it, right? These three different aspects of technical analysis and develop it into a TA framework that you can use to find trading opportunities in the stock markets. Okay, now let's move on. So in this section, I want to discuss about risk management for stock trading. All right? This is an important concept. Doesn't matter whether you're trading stocks, forex, futures, bonds, or whatsoever. Risk management is paramount for a trader or a speculator or whatever. It's paramount. And let me explain to you, you know, why risk management is so important. Right? Because you can have a profitable trading system that makes money, otherwise known as an H. But if you do not have proper risk management, doesn't matter, you're still going to blow up your trading account. And let me prove it to you. So let's assume, right, that uh, there is this trading system, right? It wins 50% of the time with an average of a 1 to 2 risk reward ratio. What does risk reward ratio means is that for every dollar that you risk, right, in the long run, on average, right, you will get back $2 in profit. So if let's say you risk $100, right, your profit, right, in the long run, right, it's two hundred dollars. So that's a risk reward ratio of a one to two, meaning that you know, for every dollar you risk, you get back two dollars in short. And let's say that there are two traders, right, John and Sally. John is an aggressive trader; he's go big or go home kind of trader, and he risks fifty percent of his account on each trade. Whereas Sally, she's more conservative, and she only risks one percent of her account on each trade. So let's say you know they both have a let's say, to keep things simple, a hundred k account. So what this means is that John, right, whenever he put on a trade, right, he would put 50% of this amount, which is $50,000, at risk for each trade. Means if the trade hits his stop loss, he's down $50,000. Whereas Sally, she risks 1% of her account on each trade. So this means 1% of 100K, which is $1,000. So this means if a trade hits Sally's stop loss, right, she loses $1,000. And let's say hypothetically, right, the the next 10 trades, the outcome are, are this outcome. Lose, 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 win, win, lose, lose, win, win, win. So it's again, uh, half of them are losers, half of them are winners. And now John, since he risked 50% of his account on each trade, you can see that you know over here, lose and lose, right? By here, he has essentially wiped out on the second trade because he risked 50% of his account on each trade. So let's just give John a big fat X. So sorry to all the Johns out there, nothing against you, just a common name that I decided to go with. How about Sally? Okay, so Sally, let's have a look, right? So lose, 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 right? So it's minus 1%, minus 1%, minus 1%. Win, win, right? So you know again, when she wins, right, she gets an average of a one to two risk reward ratio. So if she wins, she makes two times her initial risk. So it is positive, 2% plus two, plus two. Again here, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Then win, 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 right? So let's do it here. Plus two, plus two, plus two. So as for Sally, right? What is the net outcome for her? What's the net profit that she's, she made? Well, if you calculate it, right? You know that she is up a positive return of 5%. And compare that with John, who blew up his trading account. You can see that clearly, right? Having a poor, a profitable trading system is not the only part of the equation, you still must take into account your risk management because as I've just shared with you, a profitable trading system without proper risk management will still cause you to lose in the long run. So risk management is paramount. And in this case, right, Sally who risk 1% risk on each trade, right, end up, you know, making a positive return over time. So now the question is, 
how do you you know put on your trades such that if the trade hits your stop loss you lose not more than one percent of your trading account how do you do that okay so i'm i'm gonna show you how to do it it's very simple uh this is a spreadsheet that you know i i developed myself you can just google uh, stock trading position sizing calculator and you probably can find something similar so what you'll do is that uh, again most of these calculators perform in the same way you just put in what is your your capital so let's assume with 100k okay and your risk is one percent okay let's say you want to buy a stock and you will identify what is the entry price that you're going to buy the stock at what price will you buy so let's say we keep things simple you buy at hundred dollars and let's say at a stop right your stop loss right for the trade is at eighty dollars so what this will do is that you will see that this value over here is the risk dollar this simply is a function of this one percent multi i mean the, the one percent of hundred thousand this gives you a thousand dollars over here how about the number of shares there is 50 how do you get this value of 50 again very simple you just take this uh thousand dollars divide by twenty dollars why twenty dollars because that's the difference between your buy price and your stop loss level right i repeat right the difference between your entry price and your stop loss level that is twenty dollars so you take your risk amount right the notional amount divide by this twenty dollars it gives you the number of shares which is 50. okay and what this means is that if you put on a trade set your buy point at hundred dollars stop loss at eighty dollars you buy 50 shares you put in a 50 number of shares and if the trade hits your stop loss you will lose thousand dollars on that trade which is equivalent to the one percent risk of your initial capital okay so there's one a couple of things that i want to point out right so your number of shares that you buy it's 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 never fixed yeah it's dependent on on a couple of things number one the title your stop loss right meaning let's say now instead of 80 dollars stop loss we have a 90 dollars stop loss so this means your buy price and your stop loss level now is only ten dollars so the title your stop loss right the higher the number of shares you can buy while you still keep your risk constant okay and likewise if you increase the size of your stop loss let's say now it's a 50 dollars notice that you only can buy 20 shares at this point in time okay so the number of shares that you buy is a function of the the size of your stop loss the wider it is the lesser the number of shares you can buy the tighter it is right the more the number of shares that you can buy all right and still while keeping your risk constant over here needless to say right if you increase your risk amount if you risk like you know like john 50 percent right you can buy more shares right by the same time right you risk losing 50 percent of your account in this case okay so this is a, a just a very simple uh stock position sizing calculator you can google it all right and uh, i've just pretty much shared with you the formula and how it works right uh play around with the figures right and you pretty much you know understand right how risk management works in stocks Okay, so with that said, let's do a quick recap, shall we? Uh, my suggestion is again, right, if you are getting involved in trading, right, try not to risk more than 1% of your trading capital as per the example I just shared with you earlier, right? So most traders are usually between the realm of, you know, 1-2%, but I would say just stick with 1%. If you can risk smaller, like 0.5%, go ahead, right? Because the, uh, the smaller your losses, right, the lesser you pay in tuition fees, right, to the market. Uh, second thing to note is that the tighter your stop loss, right, the larger you can put on your position size, the more the number of shares you can buy while still keeping your risk constant. And finally, right, the larger your stop loss, right, the smaller the number of shares that you must buy, right, to keep your risk constant. Okay, so with that said, right, I'll see you in the next section. Okay, so you've learned a lot so far, right? We've covered, the, you know, the basics of stock trading. What is a stock? We talk about fundamental analysis, technical analysis, risk management, and I know, right, there is a lot to swallow at this point in time. So I just want to, you know, kind of piece the puzzles together so you can see the big picture, right, of what we are trying to accomplish over here. So let me just do it, right, by showing with you a trade example, right, a simulated trade example. Okay, so let's say uh, this is the... Uh, chart of coca-cola let's assume that you know uh coca-cola it's a fundamentally strong company right let's say earnings is improving revenue is beating analyst estimate year on year and you know all the good stuff is coming out of coca-cola so that is a, a good piece of fundamental and that is a stock that we want to focus on next thing we look at the technicals right so we look at coca-cola and we notice that this market i think it's in an uptrend right let me just you know pull out the 200 ma and see whether the price is above it so as you know right 
we can define the long-term trend using the 200 MA. If the price is above the 200 MA, we want to be, to be a buyer. If the price is below it, we want to be a seller or at least, you know, just stay in cash. So in this case, Coca-Cola is above the 200 MA. And if you recall, right, just because the price is in an uptrend doesn't mean we buy immediately. Why is that? Right, because the second thing that we look for is, right, can you remember what's the second thing? So first thing is trend. Okay, trend we know is up, price above 200 MA. Second thing is the area of value. We want to buy when the price is at an area of value. And in this case, if you notice, right, price has bounced off the 200 MA once, twice, and now it's here for a third time. And not only that, right, if you notice, from a market structure perspective, uh, this is a resistance, 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 resistance. And when the price breaks out of resistance, it tends to come back and becomes previous resistance become support, right? That's a, uh, some additional technical analysis tidbit for you if, you, you if you're unaware, right? Whenever price breaks above resistance, it tends to retest uh, previous resistance which will become support. And if price breaks below support, right, that level of support, that area of support will become resistance. So in this case, right, clearly the price is also at an area of value. And now the third thing, entry trigger. Do we have an entry trigger to, that tells us that, hey, you know, the buyers are stepping in, right, about to push price higher. So if you look carefully, right, over here, we have a bullish reversal pattern, right? I think it's uh, called a piercing pattern where you can see that the buyers the candle opened near the lows of the days. Buyers stepped in, pushed the price higher, closing at the highs of the day, almost the highs. Okay, so this is a sign of strength from the buyers. So we have three things or four things. Number one, fundamentals are good. Number two, trend is up. Number three, from an area of value. And number four, we have a strong bullish reversal pattern telling us that, you know, hey, buyers are in control and the price could possibly hit higher. But if you recall earlier, Risk management is important, right? Because you can have a profitable trading system or strategy, but without proper risk management, right? You could still, you know, lose in the long run. So now the question is, how do you put on a trade such that if the trade sours, such that if the trade, you know, goes against you, you only lose a fraction of your trading capital or 1% of your trading capital. So how many shares of Coca-Cola do you buy? Okay, so before we can answer that question, right? We have to ask ourselves, where is our entry point? Right, to keep things simple, let's say our entry point is at $47. And let's say we have a stop loss at $45. So with that in mind, just pull out your position sizing calculator. You can Google it. It's, it's a, it's, there's a lot of free ones out there. Let's say again, you have a capital of $100,000. And again, you're conservative, you risk 1%. Buy price, $47. Stop loss, $45. So in this case, you can buy 500 shares of Coca-Cola. Okay, and if the price hits $45, if it hits your stop loss, right, you will lose $1,000 on the trade, which is 1% of your trading account. Okay, so you can see that over here, Coca-Cola, you can buy at $47, which is this, let me just get out the tool over here, $47, change this to green, and I'll put this one in red. Okay, red color, okay, so you can see over here, this is my entry price. Right, about 47. Let me just adjust it. 47. And this over here is my stop loss at 45. Ah, I'm not going to be anal with this, right? So you, you get it, right? This is the entry point. This is the stop loss. Okay, so this is how you actually, you know, kind of piece the puzzles together, right? From uh, looking at, you know, a technical risk management and then, you know, position sizing such that you don't blow up your trading account. So one aspect that I've not really covered is your exits. Where do you exit your trade? So now this is a very broad topic. We can, you know, discuss this until the cows come home, right? right? So, but generally, right, you want to exit your trade, right? Let's say you're a swing trader, right? Where you just want to capture one swing in the market. Just, you know, that one move, shoo, one move, right? Uh, as a swing trader, what you want to do is to exit your trade, right? Where there is potential selling pressure or where potential selling pressure could come in and push the price lower. So you want to ask yourself, at where on this chart, right, would selling pressure come in and push the price lower? So if you ask me, right, again, I, I like to reference to market structure, I would say that this is a possible level and this one over here. Because this one over here could possibly become previous support, right, that could act as resistance, something that I just covered earlier. And this over here is just an obvious resistance level smack into the $50 price range. So if you ask me, a possible level that you want to consider taking profits could be this is your first level, and this would be a second level to consider.
okay so this is how you can go about you know exiting your trades of course this is just one approach right it's from a swing trading approach you can adopt a trend following approach as well where you try to you know write trends in the market but again it's not within the scope of this video to cover it if you want to learn more i can uh, point you to some relevant resource towards the end of this video but for now right for now i hope you have a good example right of how you can actually you know take the knowledge that you have learned so far right and apply it to your own stock trading okay so of course do it on demo paper trade first all right once you're confident right then you can take it to the live markets all right so with that said let's move on by the way if you're enjoying the content so far hit the thumbs up button if you don't enjoy it hit the thumbs up button anyway because my name is Raina Teo. So moving on in this section, right, we'll be discussing about the different types of trading methods. As a stock trader, right, there are different ways to skin a cat. You can be a day trader, a swing trader, or a position trader. So let me explain to you, right, what are these type of different trading methods and the pros and cons, right, to each. First and foremost, right, day trading. So day trading, you're usually trading, right, below the one hour time frame possibly the 5 or 15 minutes time frame. And your goal as a day trader is to capture the intraday volatility, right? Most stocks, right, I think we pretty much move about, you know, 2-3% uh, a day. So as a day trader, you're trying to capture this, uh, you know, intraday move of the stock. And you usually exit your positions, right, uh, by the end of the day, right? Before the, the market closed, you would exit your position. So there's no so-called overnight risk for a day trader. So the pros of a day trader is that you can actually, you know, be profitable on most months, right? If you're good at it, you have an edge, right? You can make money on most months, even, you know, generate a full-time income or a career out of trading. The downside to it is that, you know, day trading, it's stressful. It requires lots of screen time and the opportunity cost is high, really high because, you know, you spend so much time day trading and if you don't make it, right, the opportunity cost, right, it's possibly five figures or more because you could possibly be working elsewhere a full-time job making maybe four thousand a month right if you for a year that's like almost like what 48 50 thousand so if you go into day trading and after one year you don't make it you can see that your opportunity cost is you know easily five figures so bear this in mind okay so this is day trading and uh you know what you can expect moving on swing trading so swing trading typically you operate between the one hour and the daily time frame okay the role as a swing trader is that you just want to capture one move in the market. So let me explain. So for example, let's say the market it's in a in a range, okay, and market swings up and swings down. So as a swing trader, you possibly look to buy near the lows of the range, and as the market heads up higher, you exit right before the highs of this resistance. So you can see that in essence, right, as a swing trader, you're just trying to capture this one piece of the move over here. So this is just an example in a range market. Similarly, if the market is trending, you just capture that one, you know, one wave of the trend. Okay, so that's what I mean by one move in the market. So the pros of swing trading is that, you know, it's less stressful. You don't need much screen time because you are trading off uh, the higher time frames. But the downside to it is that chances are, right, because of your lesser frequency of trades, you won't make money on most months, right? If you're good, possibly you can make money on most quarters. And another downside is that you will not be able to write trends, right? Because as a swing trader, you're just capturing one move in the market. Let's say, you know, if the move, you know, it breaks out higher, right? You're already off the trade. So, you know, that's a downside that, you know, you won't be able to write a trend. Okay, and finally, right, position trading. So position trading is the, I would say it's the longest form of trading is where you are largely trading off the daily and the weekly time frame. And your goal as a position trader is to write trends in the market right basically uh just to illustrate right so you know the market let's say it's in a range okay breaks out starts to trend then it reverse right so as a position trader your goal is to capture this mid of the move right the 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 mid the the bulk of the trend right that's uh, what position trader tries to do so the pros is that you know it's least stressful doesn't require much uh, screen time because you know you're trading really the higher time frame the daily and the weekly time frame and how often does you know one candle paint right for a daily time frame every one day you get one new bar for a weekly time frame every one new week you get one new bar so you can see that really there's really not much uh thing to do besides you know sitting on your hands for a position trader the cons is that you need patience. You need a lot of patience because, you know, it takes time to see results, right? Uh, position trading, you would have the least number of trades because, you know, trading opportunities don't always come, okay? And naturally, you need more time to see results 
for a position trader. So with that said, right, let's do a quick recap, right, to the different trading uh, methodologies that I've just covered. Day trading, you are looking to capture the intraday trend. Uh, operating below the one hour time frame, your trades usually last for a day or less. Swing trading, you operate between the one hour and the daily time frame, anywhere in between. Your trades usually last a few days, maybe sometimes a few weeks. And last one is position trading, usually operating on the daily time frame and higher. Your trades, right, to will last usually weeks or even months, or even you capture the really long-term trends, can be even years, right? So these are the three broad-based uh, trading methodologies that's out there, okay? And uh, with that said, right, let's uh, move on. Okay, so we have come a long way in this uh, stock trading course. And before I end, right, I just want to share with you a few stock trading tips to get you started in your stock trading career. The first tip that I have for you is don't chase the markets, right? It doesn't matter whether you're trading stocks, forex or futures, right? As a trader, as a new trader, right, there is always this urge in you, right, to chase the market where, you know, the market breaks up higher, the candle is so big, it's so bullish, and you, you want to buy, right, because you think that, man, right, it's going up forever, right, and if only I can just catch a piece of the move, right, that's what you will probably, you know, uh, think. And trust me, whenever you see this type of price action where the market is hugely bullish, right, candles are big, right, that's usually the worst time to enter the trade. So that's what I mean by don't chase the markets. So if you want me to give you a visual illustration, it would be something like this markets, uh, say it's a range, then it breaks out higher like this, like this, you know, goes up here. Then you're tempted to buy at this highs over here because, you know, the market is so bullish, the candle is so green, right? It has to go up some more. Then you, you'll think to yourself, man, I'll just, you know, get one small piece of the move. That's all I ask for. And trust me, when you buy over here, that's usually when the market collapses. Maybe it uh, does a pullback or it reverses completely. So really, right, first tip I have for you is that don't chase the market, really. Okay, uh, second thing I have for you is uh, start small. So I don't know how much money you're going to start with, right? Maybe you have uh, $50,000 to, to speculate in the markets. And my suggestion is don't risk that full $50,000. I mean, when you trade stocks, right, you don't need $50,000 to get started. I think now, nowadays with the uh, different types of broker out there, right, buying, you know, letting you buy one or two shares or even, you know, commission-free trades, right, you can start with as small as like maybe $10,000 or even $5,000 account. So start small. Don't risk your full risk capital because at the start, you're going to make plenty of mistakes. Maybe instead of buying, you hit sell. Maybe you buy the wrong stock. You want to buy, uh, say, Apple, AAPL, end up you buy another stock symbol which is maybe called AAP. You miss out the L. So really, start small. Make as many mistakes as possible. It's totally fine, right? When you ride a bicycle, you're going to fall a few times. When you trade stocks, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to lose money at the start. Same thing. So if you start small, right, your tuition fees is kept small, right? Why do you want to, you know, uh, pay, say for example, $10,000 for a trading lesson when you can actually pay that, that same lesson for like maybe three or $400? So start small, so your tuition fees is kept small, and you know you have more money later on, right, to scale up your account when you're confident and when you're ready. Third thing, risk management first. So as you start in your trading journey, right, you will be overwhelmed. Trust me, I'll be lying if I say that you know if if the trading is simple. No, you will be overwhelmed. There is a lot of information out there, and you probably will you know hop from one trading system to the next. Maybe you'll try day trading, swing trading position trading, mean reversion, trend following, momentum trading. You'll try everything and anything. But the one thing that you must not neglect is your risk management, right? You can try all the fancy systems that you want out there, right, till your heart content. But remember, your risk management comes first. Because think about this, right? If you have proper risk management in place, no matter what trading strategies that you trade, right, even if it flops, it fails, it profits, right, you will not blow up your trading account because each trade that you risk, right, is only 1% or smaller, Right, so each trade, even if you lose, right, it's just a loss of 1% to your trading account. It's not something that will destroy you. You can still live to, you know, trade another day. So no matter what, right, emphasize on risk management first. If you want to explore the different trading systems and methods out there, feel free to go ahead, but don't forget your risk management comes first. Play good defense, right, like Paul Tudor Jones said, right? You know, uh, I'm not sure what's the exact lines, but, you know, trading is all about playing good defense, good defense, and good defense. So don't forget that. And the last thing I want to share is that, you know, look at what the index is doing. So, for example, let's say you are trading the uh, stocks in the S&P 500. 
it would make sense to track, right, what is the trend, right, on the S&P 500. Kind of to serve as a, a trend filter for you to know whether you should be buying or, you know, staying in cash. So if you think about this, right, uh, there's a saying, right, a, a raising tide, right, a rising tide, right, raise all boats. And it's pretty much the same for trading. If the stock market, the broad-based index is in an uptrend, chances are stocks will be in an uptrend. If the broad-based index like the S&P 500 is in a downtrend, is in a recession, more often than not, right, most stocks will be in a downtrend. So one way to, to kind of, you know, uh, improve your trading results, right, is to, you know, trade along the path of least resistance. Look at what the broad-based index is doing, right, and then trade in the same direction of it. So one tip that I have for you is that if the S&P 500 is above the 200-day moving average, then you look to be a buyer looking to buy stocks. If the S&P 500 is below the 200-day moving average, then you stay on to cash. You don't buy stocks at all because, you know, uh, the uh, the strength or rather the trend of the S&P 500, right, is not up, right? It's maybe it's in a downtrend or, you know, it's choppy. Whatever the case is, right, the 200 MA can serve as a filter for you to know whether you should be buying stocks or holding in cash. Okay, so these are the four tips that I have for you. There's a lot more, right? But really, there's no point trying to overwhelm you. I would say these are the four one of the most important ones that I hope you, you know uh, take away from this entire stock trading course, right? I know it's a lot that has been covered. Feel free to you know go through the earlier lessons and materials if you need to. And really, right, for those of you who now want to you know uh, learn more about my trading methodology, my approach, right? Uh, you, what you can do is go down to my website over here, trading with Rainer.com, right? This is my website. And on this website, this blog, I pretty much share everything I know about trading, right? So for example, uh, we spoke about trend following earlier. How do you actually write the trends in stock? This guide over here will teach you how to do it, right? The ultimate trend following guide. It's free. Just click this orange button and I'll send it to your email address for free. And for those of you who want to learn more about technical analysis, price action, support resistance, you know, candlestick patterns, then this guide over here, the ultimate guide to price action trading is for you. Just click this orange button over here and I'll send it to your email address for free as well. Okay, so it has been a great time. I've enjoyed right producing this uh, stock trading course for beginners. So if any feedback, questions, just leave it below and I'll do my best to help. So with that said, I wish you good luck and good trading. I'll talk to you soon.